modern times, the monarchy exists in a media bubble, with the whole world looking in. Our interest in the royal family has never been greater, and every trace of the stresses they face seems to be caught on camera. The job of the 21st century monarch is certainly not an easy one. But if the demands made on the minds of modern royalty are great, they are dwarfed by those faced by kings and queens in the past. This is the story of the times of crisis when royal minds have not stood up to the job, of the measures taken when a nation's head has gone insane, of scrambles for power and desperate measures. This is the history of royal madness. In spring 1801, the deranged Queen of Portugal dressed in children's clothing to receive guests at court. In Madrid, Charles IV ruled Spain in place of his insane older brother, Philip. In St. Petersburg, the psychotic Emperor Paul I was held in terror by all who met him. In Copenhagen, the sadomasochistic dwarf king Christian VII gibbered as he beat his head against the walls of his palace till he bled. And in England, King George III was confined to his palace at Kew as his second attack of madness took hold. The case for hereditary monarchy had never sounded less convincing. It's really a piece of horrid injustice that George III is remembered for his madness when he's actually one of our most able and popular monarchs. He's dedicated. He's somebody who really cares about the public. And it's such an extraordinary shame that perhaps this combination of excessive diligence with uh, physical weakness pushes him faster and further into madness than might otherwise have been the case. Keep up, keep up. Where are you? George III, the farmer king, was a lover of nature and the countryside. He ruled for 30 years in barnstorming good health without any sign of the insanity that would come to dominate his life. Your Majesty! That sign came in the autumn of 1788, on the 22nd of October, when the King's physician, Dr. George Baker, was called to attendance. I was received by His Majesty in a very unusual manner, of which I had not the least expectation. The look of his eyes, the tone of his voice, every gesture and his whole deportment represented a person in the most furious passion of anger. God does these things for us. God in his mercy. God in his great goodness. George's first attack of madness was certainly very shocking um, um, and frightening to his contemporaries. It, it consisted of symptoms such as foaming at the mouth, rapid um, speech, um, violence, extreme bouts of passion, uh, his temples and the veins in his temples popping. And increasingly, obscene behaviour before the ladies of the court, which his drunken friends were only too quick to copy. So, so have you, are you listening, my dear? Are you listening? Are you listening? These people, they're not listening. They do not drink enough. This is the problem. Come on, the problem. But by the end of the year, it was reported that George had tried to plant a stake, believing meat to grow on bushes. How wonderful. Pay the services. So good to see you. Stay back. Stay back. Stay back. Have you no respect for his imperial majesty? So good to see you. And you've lost weight. When he attempted to shake hands with a tree after mistaking it for Frederick the Great, it was clear that George's problem was no laughing matter. George's insanity couldn't have come at a worse time. Only 13 years previously, America had declared its independence, and fighting in the colonies continued. Across the Channel, the forward march of revolution was trampling the monarchy underfoot, 
War with France and a decade-long tussle with Napoleon were just around the corner. Britain was caught in an international storm, the like of which it wouldn't see again until World War I. More than anything else, the nation needed stability and leadership. What it got instead was scandal and upheaval. George III is doubly unlucky in that he becomes mad at a time when British politics developed an absolutely superb mass information system. Uh, particularly cruelly, it's the great age of the caricature. And therefore, Parliament, the press, provincial newspapers, coffee houses and debating societies are all there online to take up the question of royal madness. Everyone in Britain, and Britain's enemies abroad, knew about George's madness. For the first time since Oliver Cromwell, the very existence of the monarchy was being openly debated. With an anxious nation looking on, the pressure on the men charged with treating the king was fearsome. But George's doctors had little first-hand experience of mental illness and often seemed to be groping in the dark. Initially, he was seen to be suffering from ague, from fever, from hurries. And there, were, there was a whole panoply of terms ascribed to George, none of which seemed to fit. Come on, sir. It was felt at first that the king was suffering from flying gout, a catch-all diagnosis for anything Georgian doctors couldn't account for. They believed it was a harmless affliction, unless it reached the head. George's doctors tried a variety of techniques to draw the gout from his body, including sweating, blistering, bleeding, and leeching. Leeches are a convenient way of taking blood. They have a sucker at each end, and they have a, a mouth which contains three jaws with some 60 odd teeth on each jaw. So that when they actually bite into you, they give you a Y-shaped wound, which of course is very difficult to heal. There are a number of places on the body where they could actually be placed, but the arm is about the most convenient. We place it onto the skin. He's now biting in and there's a small amount of pain, a bit like a pinprick. He is hungry. He is biting in. Neither leeching nor bleeding nor any other treatment offered any sort of relief and George drifted deeper into madness. Eventually, and with great reluctance, the royal doctors agreed to step down in favor of a so-called expert, Dr. Francis Willis. By the 18th century, there was a growing interest in mental disorders, but the treatment of the insane was hardly pleasant. Willis's methods ranged from the use of ropes and restraints to his own secret weapon, the eye. Your hand made well by me, sir, by me. Dr. Francis Willis had this wonderful technique of I give them the eye, sir. Yes, Your Majesty. Now, this was probably part chicanery, part just imposition of his own rather forceful personality, and part what he would see as moral therapy. That is to say, he would give his patients a particular look, and they knew that behind that look might be some limitations on what they could do. Thus, if he looked at them and said, you will have your breakfast and behave nicely, 
then they knew that if they didn't, it would be strapped into the chair or given an unpleasant emetic or whatever it might be. How the time has come for me to relieve all those problems that you have suffered. It is easy to see Willis as a caricature of medical cruelty, but the regime he imposed on George may well have saved the king from an early death. I want his treatment was probably appropriate for what was going on. They had to somehow control him or he would run out of gas and people used to die from manic exhaustion in those days. So keeping him still, making sure he ate and drank and trying to get him to control that agitation via various behavioral techniques was probably a good idea. Doctors from all over the country denounced Willis's methods but in 1789, the king recovered, and Willis was rewarded with a fat pension and state honors. The rejoicing that accompanied the news was, however, premature. Poor Frederick, poor Frederick. <laughs> he could well do with us. The royal family lived in constant dread of his regular relapses, and the attacks were taking their toll on the king's mind. In 1810, soon after somber celebrations to mark George's golden jubilee, came a final attack that marked an irrevocable descent into madness. His physician, Dr. Warren, was summoned to Parliament, where he tactfully phrased his report in Latin, Rex Noster Insanit. The king is insane. With Napoleon bearing down on Britain and Parliament in a state of panic, the race was on to understand the king's affliction. But only now, in the 21st century, can a full diagnosis finally be made. George III is Britain's most famous mad monarch, the king whose insanity seemed an open invitation for Napoleon to invade. In 1810, with Napoleon sweeping all before him, an emergency debate in Parliament declared a regency, the first ever for an adult monarch, with George's son, the Prince of Wales, stepping up to the throne. The Prince of Wales was irresponsible, a drunkard and a spendthrift, but in times of national crisis, anyone is better than a madman. George was confined to Windsor, a royal prisoner for the remaining 10 years of his life. Despite medical bills that ran into millions, the cause of George's condition was never identified and has continued to be debated right up to today. Possibly the most convincing diagnosis was one in the 60s by Hunter McAlpine, um, which suggested that George was suffering from a metabolic disorder known as porphyria. Porphyria is a strong possibility, but it's rare and difficult to diagnose with any real certainty. The king's symptoms in his later years suggest another diagnosis. By now, he had become a tragic figure, blind and deaf, living in near isolation, exposing himself to servants and addressing friends long since dead. This behavior has fueled a belief amongst modern day psychiatrists that the king's condition was nothing more exotic than manic depression. Clearly the standard story that's come down is porphyria, a very unusual and rare disease. But if you look at his, at his symptoms, it's much more likely he had manic depressive disorder. This is a commoner illness, it reflects his symptoms, and it often ends in Alzheimer's disease, senile dementia. He would speak to courtiers and, get, and mistake them and not know who people were, and that's absolutely typical. With George's death on the 29th of January, 1820, one of the most intense periods of instability in the history of the British monarchy came to a close. Under the Regency, Napoleon had been defeated and the Industrial Revolution begun. But the implications of George's madness reached far beyond his own lifetime. 
The various madnesses of George III did create a shift in the Constitution. It took us from the age in which kings still lead armies in person, which is just what um, the previous kings, George, had done, to an age in which monarchs are more ceremonial, which is just what George's son, George IV, appears as being. That 20 years of royal madness was really a settling down period in which party politicians had to learn how to do things themselves, and on the whole they did. George's political legacy was a stronger, more independent parliament. But could he also have left a genetic legacy? Just 40 years after his death, mental instability in the monarchy, now under his granddaughter, Queen Victoria, was causing chaos once again. Victoria and Albert's relationship was really unusual, I think, for the Hanoverian dynasty. They were devoted to each other. It really does seem to have been a love match, very unusually. Albert of Saxe-Coburg helped in life to make Britain great, but in death threatened Britain with disaster. For her to lose somebody who was so particularly close to her as Prince Albert was, not only her precious toy boy, but at the same time her own personal advisor, her guide, her light, her mentor, was catastrophic to her, and nothing could replace him, and indeed nothing ever did. When she lost Albert, depression would overwhelm the Queen and threaten to bring the country to the brink of revolution. Following months of unremitting work, Albert fell seriously ill. On the 7th of December, 1861, his doctors diagnosed typhoid fever. The prince is extremely ill and depressed, and the queen becomes so nervous and so easily alarmed that the greatest caution is necessary. I must tell you confidentially that it requires no little management to prevent her from breaking down altogether. After days of drifting in and out of a delirious fever, Albert died at 10 minutes to 11 on the evening of the 14th of December. I took his dear left hand, which was already cold, and knelt down by him. All, all was over. I stood up and kissed his dear heavenly forehead and called out in a bitter and agonizing cry, oh, my dear darling. It was a black moment for Victoria and the beginnings of a 20-year national crisis. All over Europe, monarchies were being forced out of existence. At a time when Britain desperately needed its queen to be popular and strong, she began to withdraw into herself. From modern times, it looks as if the 19th century monarchy is incredibly stable. It's actually not. The French keep declaring republics, there are revolutions in other parts of Europe, and monarchies are trying to destroy each other. So it's a tough time. And therefore, when Victoria uh, seems to step off the throne, it's a particularly bad moment at which to cease being an effective queen. The average length of a Victorian widow's public mourning was a matter of months but the Queen's mourning was to last for the remaining 40 years of her life and reign. Truly, the Prince was my entire self, my very life and soul. I only lived through him, my heavenly angel. Surely there can never have been such a union, such trust and understanding between two people. I try to feel and think that I am living on with him and that his pure and perfect spirit is leading and inspiring me. Victoria often spoke of Albert as though he were present in the room and would even consult him before signing official documents. It was not long before there were genuine fears in the royal household for the Queen's mental state. The royal household began to, to really, I think, fear for the Queen's sanity. It was a subject she herself had brought up. She had confided in ministers like Lord, Lord Clarendon that she felt perhaps she was, she was losing her mind. 
George III, remember, had only died in 1820, not very long ago at all, um, within many people's living memory. And it was a subject that hovered over Victoria, if you like. She suffered from immense depressions after each of her uh, children was born, which is a rather ironic given how many children she had. And gradually, more and more uh, spectators began to believe that she was indeed slipping into insanity. Engulfed by grief for her beloved husband, and lacking anyone with the status or courage to shake her back to reality, the Queen's behaviour freewheeled from eccentricity towards obsession. To continue going around looking very much like a, a bombazine muffin, poor little thing, tiny as she was, was something that was considered rather eccentric. Her uh, letters are all, all have a, a, a black border to start with, which gradually gets bigger and bigger. Little laughter, although it's fair to say that there was laughter some 15, 20 years after uh, Prince Albert had died. She has a cast made of his hand, which he sleeps with, which yeah, is, is a little spooky, I think. It's a good thing it was only his hand. At Windsor, the Queen had begun her marathon period of mourning by photographing every part of the room in which her husband had died to ensure that nothing in it would ever change. A jug of hot water was placed each morning on Albert's washstand, and fresh flowers strewn on his pillows. His dressing gown and fresh clothes were laid each evening on his bed. Ladies-in-waiting began to tap their temples as the Queen went past. Could the head of the world's largest empire really be losing her mind? There are a number of behaviours related to mourning that clearly are not healthy. Hanging on to mementos, particularly rather unnecessary mementos, a cast of, his, of Albert's hand or hanging on to all his clothes, all his underpants, that's worrying. And bereavement um, counselling encourages people to get rid of all this stuff. Certainly Victoria and her withdrawal, her bereavement, it was unusual. No doubt about it. It was a prolonged bereavement reaction which many people would see may well have gone into a formal depressive illness. Just as stress was a new disease for the 20th century, the Victorians invented depression. But Victorian doctors' understanding of the condition was rudimentary. The Queen's medicine chest, which remains at Osborne House, is evidence that her doctors tried to pull Victoria back from the brink of breakdown with a powerful cocktail of drugs. Morphine and laudanum act on the brain in the same way as heroin, and certainly would have made the Queen feel happy, for a short while at least. But they were in no way an effective long-term treatment of depression. By the end of 1862, Victoria seemed to be living in self-imposed exile on the Isle of Wight at Osborne House the home Albert had built for them both. Reform bills were passed, wars fought, and discoveries made, all in her absence. For many, her actions seemed like an unofficial abdication. The Queen's health and nerves require an interval of bracing mountain air and comparative quiet, or she will break down completely. And if the public will not take her as she is, she must give all up. Giving all up was exactly what many people thought she should do. And revolutionaries and reformers were now even finding the courage to demand the abolition of the monarchy altogether. Cabinet ministers are constantly enjoining her to come back to London. Because of the strength of Republican feeling, and one mustn't underestimate that, um, there really was a belief, I think, growing in, in Britain at the time that the monarchy was becoming irrelevant. 
encapsulated in, in uh, comments from even from the Times, the, the official organ of the day. And um, uh, there appears this marvellous poster in 1864 on the gates of Buckingham Palace saying that this, this, these premises will be let or sold uh, due to the decline in the late occupant's business. As Republican rumblings grew even louder, the establishment creaked into action, seeking to boost the monarchy's flagging popularity with pomp and pageantry. The Prime Minister, Disraeli, full of flattery and encouragement, finally brought the Queen back into the outside world to carnival-like rejoicing. Queen Victoria did come out of that period of mourning, but she was a little bit like Harley Davidson, always black, does better with a kickstart. And she had three kickstarts uh, being made. Empress of India was the first thing. The Golden Jubilee certainly got her towards the, the fall, and the Diamond Jubilee was something that she took great care in planning. The magnificent jubilees of 1887 and 1897 marked the point when British monarchs ceased to be decision takers and policy makers. During Victoria's absence from government, Parliament became more and more powerful, and when she returned, she found she'd become a mere icon, a figurehead to be brought out for display. The constitutional monarchy as we know it today was born. A monarch's mental state would never again threaten the well-being of Britain. But what happened in the days before Victoria, when a monarch wielded absolute power? In medieval times, royal madness was a matter of life and death. The story of royal madness in Britain begins in the 1300s, in France. Of all of history's royal madmen, the reign of King Charles VI of France was the most disastrous. Overrun by invading armies, he lost his kingdom along with his mind. Medieval monarchs had a very demanding role to play. They had to lead from the front. It was very hands-on exercise. They not only reign, but they rule. Charles VI is a good king when he begins his reign. Uh, he's very affable, he's very genial, he's very athletic. He does all the right things expected of a young prince in the late 14th century. And it is the great tragedy that this illness um, afflicts him when the early signs had been very good. The onset of Charles's madness is an incident which happened on a very hot August day in 1392. He's riding with a military force to attack the, the Duke of Brittany. They reach a forest near Le Mans, and in the August heat, one of his pages falls asleep. The page's lance drops, crashes against the helmet of one of the other pages. This causes a tremendous shock. Charles reacts violently, saying, I am betrayed, I am betrayed, and starts to sl slash around him with his sword. He kills five men. The sword is broken. He falls off his horse, rolls his eyes, and goes into a two-day coma. Fourteenth-century chronicles recorded that when the king came to, he was confused and violent. He is delusional and declares that he is not married and never had children. And likewise, he forgets his own person and his title of King of France. He believed he was being persecuted by his followers, and he also felt himself to be profoundly fragile and vulnerable to attacks by magicians. Um, at one stage in his delusionary state, he actually thought he was made of glass and could be shattered by his enemies. No! 
This symptom especially baffled Charles's physicians. But for the modern psychiatrist, it represents a vital clue as to what Charles was really suffering from. The illness of Charles VI has been much debated and he had lots of symptoms and it's well reported. He quite clearly, though, had schizophrenic symptoms. And the most interesting one is the sense that he is made of glass or that his body needs supporting and needs a metal rod to keep it going. And uh, this is fascinating, the fear that your body has changed. This is so typically uh, delusional in the schizophrenic sense. The sense your body has been changed, you are no longer a proper person, you are something else. People look in mirrors and say, you know, who am I? Charles descended into madness, and French government was paralyzed at its heart. The English seized their opportunity to launch an invasion. Without a strong king to unite behind, France's nobility began to fight amongst themselves. It was Charles's ultimate misfortune that the man at the head of the invading army was perhaps the greatest ever warrior king of England, Henry V. As the political situation spiraled out of control, Charles's desperate doctors determined to wrench the once dominant king back to sanity. Charles's mental illness began with a great shock, and one of the remedies that was prescribed by his doctors at one point was that he should receive another shock uh, in the hope that uh, the reverse effect might occur. The shock treatment prescribed by his doctors at one point was that some of his servants should have their faces blackened and appear almost as devils and jump out at him uh, to surprise him. This, in fact, does have some beneficial effect. There is a temporary remission from the illness. But Charles's recovery lasted just a matter of weeks. And when he relapsed, the government was plunged back into crisis. Science and reason had failed. And now, a procession of priests, sorcerers and mystics took center stage. For many in the Middle Ages believed that madness was a punishment from God. Charles's life um, gave many examples uh, of behavior which the church would consider um, to be totally reprehensible. His love of male favorites, his expenditure on the court, his wild parties, his louche lifestyle. Augustinian monks attempted an exorcism using magic spells and a potion of powdered pearls. When they failed, they were tortured and beheaded. In the age of George III or Victoria, a malfunctioning monarch might be replaced. But in the Middle Ages, when kings were directly appointed by God, no one had the power to depose them. For good government to be restored, a strong man had to seize the reins. And in the Middle Ages, this could mean only one thing. Not a parliamentary debate, but civil war and bloodshed. Under enormous pressure, with the entire country at stake, Charles's physicians resorted to extremes. They would release the devils tormenting the royal mind by drilling into his skull. Trefining the skull, or the old term which means the same thing, trepanning the skull, really means making a, a hole in the skull, or a series of holes in the skull dates back to at least 10,000 BC, carried out amazingly enough all over the world. There are obviously a, a range of ways that you can trepan, um, and probably each surgeon would have had his own preferred method. Certainly you would have to have somebody to keep the patient still. No anaesthetic, first anaesthetic ever used, 1846. So over the centuries, the only anaesthetic inverted commas, would be three or four strong assistants holding the screaming patient down. You would then take a knife of some sort and you would either make a cross cut or a T-shaped incision into the skin so that you can then peel the skin flaps back 
He'd be screaming and struggling, furiously. This and other operations might have to be abandoned because the patient just, just couldn't tolerate the, the agony. Now, it would be quite normal to actually stuff the ears of the person with wool so they can't actually hear grating of the bone. The application of the drill to the lining of the bone, the periosteum, we call it, the membrane over the bone, that's very painful. And again, there would be a terrific struggle. This is the type of tool they're quite likely to have used. The skull is very tough, but this is surprisingly effective. Though the operation would have to be carried out very slowly and carefully, and you'd have to keep stopping to check how far through the skull you were. Interestingly enough, once you're down onto bare bone, that's painless. So the actual drilling of the bone itself, the patient would probably have a sigh of relief to think that the agony, at least for the moment, had stopped. Of course, trefining the skull for any underlying brain defect would have absolutely no effect at all. It was really quack medicine. Charles survived the operation but never fully regained his sanity. <laughs> Henry V destroyed the French armies at the Battle of Agincourt. To seal his victory, he even married Charles's daughter. Their son, Henry VI, came to the throne as a baby. He inherited the kingdoms of both England and France from his heroic father. But he also received an inheritance from his French grandfather, King Charles. His madness. The situation which Henry VI inherits when he comes to the throne is actually a superlative one produced by genius, his father Henry V. England's conquered about a quarter of France, it's on its way to conquering the remaining three quarters. The exchequer is full, Parliament's friendly and the government's wildly popular. But by the time Henry came of age, it was already clear he was a shadow of the man his father was, as he struggled to control his father's empire in France and keep peace at home. In 1450, an armed rebellion protesting at rises in taxation and crime summed up the national mood. The strain on the king's mind was immense. He really lost it, as one might say, in 1453, when he lapsed into a catatonic state. He was completely insensible. He couldn't even speak. He showed no signs of life at all. As government began to break down and anarchy set in, Henry, now into his 30s, was barely more effective than when he first came to the throne at just one year of age. He certainly was stuporous, i.e. he didn't react, he sat there doing nothing, and that fits with severe forms of depression, melancholia, as well as catatonic schizophrenia. He never matures. He remains at the stage of a not particularly observant or interested five or six-year-old child. At his best, all he's doing is reacting to what others are telling him to do. He seems to have no interest in life in its own right, and no real interest whatsoever in being a king. But the king's consent was required for every act of government. If Henry had no interest in his duties, who would rule the country? The question loomed larger as the 15th century became more bloody. In the end, it would spell disaster for Henry and his dynasty, and ruin for England. Henry VI, King of England and France in the 15th century, and heir to the triumphant reign of Henry V, suffered a disastrous breakdown in 1453 that rendered him powerless as a king.
he was as immobile as a statue. Not even the birth of his only son provoked a reaction. At the baby prince's coming to Windsor, the Duke of Buckingham took him in his arms and presented him to the king, beseeching the king to bless him. And the king gave no answer. And when no answer came, the queen came in and took the prince and presented him as the duke had done. But their labor was in vain. It was the job of a 15th century monarch to grasp the nettle of government and impose order on an often unruly age. But with Henry's mind fogged by stupor, his ambitious magnates vied for power and position. Henry's restoration to sanity was a vital priority if his Lancastrian dynasty and Britain's empire in France were going to survive. Understandably, given Henry's catatonic state, uh, medical practitioners about him were anxious to try and wake him up. Henry's doctors could draw on a number of procedures designed to repair a damaged mind, all of which had been in use for hundreds of years. It is necessary for lethargics that people talk loudly in their presence. Tie the extremities lightly and rub their palms and soles hard. And let their feet be put in salt water. And pull their hair and nose and squeeze the toes and fingers tightly. Put a feather or a straw in his nose to compel him to sneeze. And do not ever desist from hindering him from sleeping. Henry's treatments seem barbaric, but the royal doctors were skilled and respected men. Their knowledge was carefully recorded. Details of some of the treatments Henry received still survive. Henry would have had three doctors, and the doctors would have sent prescriptions for his treatment through to the palace apothecary, who would have made up the recipes in much the same way as I'm doing here. This is a recipe from the 14th century for an enema, or clister, designed to treat melancholia. First of all, wormwood, its close cousin, southernwood, calamint. Um, calamint is cooling and soothing, so it would have counteracted the very strong effects of the first two. Oregonum. We have althea, dog's mercury, which is also purgative. And lastly, when all this is ground to a powder, we're going to add a few drops of olive oil. In order to administer an enema such as this, they would have used something that looks rather like an icing syringe made of pewter. They would have filled it with the medicine. They would have inserted it into his rectum and filled him with up to half a pint of the medicine. This type of treatment would have been very painful, very unpleasant, and the effect would have been instantaneous. Standard things, purgatives, emetics, blistering, uh, bleeding, the, the normal pharmacopoeia of medieval practitioners probably wasn't as useless as we like to think. Um, people may have had uh, significant constipation, uh, which would have been cured. They may well have used alkaloids to do this, and those do have a mild antidepressant effect. Overall, they probably did no harm. Indeed, in Henry's case, there is some evidence that his treatment did him good. After almost a year of stupor, he began to show signs of a return to sanity. But the king's recovery was short-lived. In France, all that remained of his father's empire was the port of Calais. Under enormous pressure from all sides, Henry's earlier mental problems returned with a vengeance. His only refuge was religion. Medieval kings needed to be devout, or at least seemed to be. But with France now lost, the treasury empty and order collapsing, action, not piety, was required. And if Henry couldn't provide it, someone else would have to. 
Rival factions now went to war to decide who that someone would be. The Wars of the Roses are an all-out fight between two lots of the royal family for the right to rule England. And it happens because you have a dud king, Henry VI, and after 20 years of his displaying a complete inability to rule the land, the royal family loses its temper. One bit of it wants to replace him with a candidate of its own, the other bit wants to rule on his name, and that's the Wars of the Roses. As the fighting escalated, Henry was captured and led in disgrace through the streets of London to be imprisoned in the tower. On the 4th of May, 1471, Henry's supporters were defeated at Tewkesbury, and his son and heir, Edward, struck down as he fled. And soon, the man who had presided over England's collapse as a medieval superpower met his death too. Folklore has it that Henry was struck about the head as he knelt and prayed in the tower. Certainly, when his body was exhumed in the 20th century, the hair was thickly matted with blood. It could easily be said the best thing that Henry VI ever did was to die. Of course, he didn't do it himself. It had to be done for him like everything else. A century in which royal madness had torn Europe apart finally drew to a close. The days when insanity in the head of state could change the course of British history are over. But even today, 500 years after Henry VI, concern with royal states of mind remains intense. A mad monarch in modern times could still sound the death knell for the monarchy. So no one could blame the royal family when it was seemingly caught in 1987 trying to cover up a lingering trace of royal insanity. I knew it was a mega story at the time, and I was proved right when it made headlines around the world. We rang Buckingham Palace, who were absolutely uh, aghast at what was being alleged. Two of the Queen Mother's nieces, both severely mentally disabled and languishing in a Victorian asylum, had been discovered in old age, though both had been listed as dead in Burke's peerage decades before. There were many people within that family who did not want the world to know that insanity uh, was part of their makeup. The more you inbreed, the more possible it is to have uh, insanity or at least uh, mental disturbances. For example, the Queen, Elizabeth II, is related uh, to her husband, Prince Philip, in 84 different ways. The press smacked its lips at the scent of a fresh royal scandal and pointed out with relish that the sister's condition was hereditary. It may yet be that the history of royal madness has still to see its final chapter.